From the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, this is Taxed and Wasted, a podcast about tax, regulation, and waste. I'm your host, Emilio Garcia. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Taxed and Wasted by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. In a little bit, we're going to talk to Stefan Levera about Bitcoin. He has a huge, huge YouTube channel and a huge following on Twitter because of his expertise with Bitcoin as well as uh, other uh, economics um, discussions he likes to have. But what we're going to do first is go over the uh, news that we found relevant here at the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. Just quickly, I'll say that the reason that we changed the podcast name from Adipod to Taxed and Wasted is because we thought, uh, first of all, the name was more representative and indicative of what we do at the ATA, but also Adipod was hard to find on podcasting apps and on Google, so this is a bit of a marketing exercise as well. Getting started with the news of the week, uh, we had the Greens, the Greens Party, put in a Freedom of Information uh, Act request to the New South Wales Police Department, at which point we learned that the New South Wales Police had a quota of 241,000 personal searches that they had to conduct in 12 months. This opened up a lot of questions. The first kind of baseline question is, is it reasonable for law enforcement to have quotas in place? Uh, ostensibly, the if you have KPIs, key performance indicators for law enforcement, they should be reductions in crime, things like that, increased security. But instead, it seems what they're Uh, trying to measure is how many interactions with civilians, hostile interactions with civilians they can have. So is that a good thing? Definitely not. But this ties into a scandal that we saw here in New South Wales some months ago, where it turns out that there were a lot of underage people, uh, kids, getting strip searched at music festivals. Uh, This was mostly music festivals, I, I, I should say. Uh, mostly, apparently, there was a, a disproportionate amount of young girls as well that were being strip searched, which, uh, despite the fact that there were both boys and girls having, uh, essentially having to get naked in front of police officers, there were more young girls than men, which uh, I don't want to necessarily draw a conclusion on, but it is pretty strange to say the least. Uh, th- so this, this scandal breaks out some time back, and people ask the question reasonably, uh, is this legal? Do police officers have a right to tell an underage person without uh, their parent's supervision that they need to um, get naked so they can be searched for drugs? And there was apparently nothing in, in the law or the regulations or anything that, that the police had at, at, at their disposal that said that they had a special right to do something like this. And yet, it turns out that uh, with all the authority in the world, with a weapon, they were telling young boys and young girls, uh, we're going to strip search you. Another thing about that that scandal some months back is that these kids were being searched for kind of particular reasons. So sometimes it was that a a drug-sniffing dog would go up to them and sit down next to them, something of the sort. And when a dog sits down next to you, uh, a drug-sniffing dog, he's indicating to the police officer that you have something on you. Uh, So a couple of them were like that. But oftentimes, the kids who were being searched were searched because the police said that they had a kind of a flinching reaction towards seeing a dog, a drug-sniffing dog. And the police officer would be like, oh, well, you're flinching. You're reacting badly towards this drug-sniffing dog. That's enough reason for me to then take you into a tent and force you to get naked in front of me. So obviously pretty bad stuff. So we started off with a really nefarious behavior, nefarious illegal behavior by the police, uh, allegedly. Uh, then we we get this uh, these documents released by the Greens, which, by the way, kudos to the Greens. Uh, that said that they had this quota, which should have never even been considered. And now, it seems that New South Wales has simply ended the investigation into these strip searches. 
Now, to be clear, it didn't come to its conclusion. Uh, then they realized that nothing had been done that was wrong, and thus uh, that's the end of the story. Rather, without the investigation having been concluded, New South Wales just decided to stop it. Uh, really bad stuff on behalf of the New South Wales government, really good stuff on behalf of the Greens. If I may actually take the chance before I move on to the next subject to praise the Greens, they've done some really good work recently. Uh, they, first of all, got this freedom of information request uh, in, and because of it, we know what the New South Wales police was, were, were doing, so that's absolutely fantastic. Good job to the Greens. And they've also come out against the cash ban, which, uh, if, if you follow us closely, you know, we've been at the forefront of uh, opposing. So fantastic work. Credit where credit is due. We don't always align the Greens and the ATA, but this is uh, absolutely fantastic work on their part. Now we're going to move on to the rains that hit uh, New South Wales uh, two weekends ago. This will be released on Tuesday, so this will have been two weeks ago. There were pretty heavy rains in Sydney. And as a result, 134,000 people were left without electricity. Now, it's not like Sydney is a city that has rare rains. Rain, and especially heavy rain, like rain with, at incredible speeds, are a pretty frequent yearly phenomenon in Sydney. So it's curious to, uh, to observe that, that the city would be so ill-prepared uh, in, in dealing with these floods, uh, with these rains, but uh, we did have a lot of flooding, and so a lot of people continue to be without energy. We just bring this up because it's strange that uh, 134,000 people uh, around the city were completely without power and energy uh, for something that is pretty predictable. Sydney, there are rains. We should have been prepared. Uh, the one space that we want the government to be solid on and for our spending to go is towards proper infrastructure, public infrastructure. So we, uh, we definitely need some improvement there. Moving on to Huawei. Apparently, research grants from the Australian government have been linked to Huawei, totaling $262 million. Apparently, the grants have been given to universities that are uh, doing different types of research. And this seems to have found its way to benefiting the Chinese government for different uh, military uh, technologies. Uh, a couple of questions are obvious here. The first one is, why are we giving money to universities to undertake different uh, studies such as these? Universities such as the University of Sydney, for example, have endowments that are the size of the economy of small countries. They, they are very wealthy and they don't need government assistance. Uh, but, apparent, but that leads us to the second question, which is, if we must fund uh, different research, different types of research that is done in universities, shouldn't we be sure that this isn't going to hostile foreign powers? Uh, the Chinese government was working to get a Manchurian candidate into our parliament as a spy. We know this from the uh, the whistleblower, the leaker that, that came forth some time back and is seeking asylum here in Australia. And yet somehow, we seem to continue a very simpatico relationship with China. So uh, not only is the government being irresponsible with our tax money and giving it to people who don't need it, to institutions that don't need it, but uh, that money is also benefiting a hostile foreign power. Not good stuff. I'll touch quickly on the NBN uh, that is being rolled out now. It's, uh, I believe it's actually coming to its conclusion. But you'll be shocked to hear that it turns out that with new technologies entering Australia, different 5G technologies and other uh, internet uh, resources that are being created by pi a private industry, it seems the NBN will be obsolete within the next couple of years. So we spent $51 billion on an infrastructure project that many people said, should have been left in the hands of the private industry. But alas, uh, the government continued ahead. Once we were $10 billion in, uh, it was clear that this had been a failed project. And uh, yet they, I guess, for uh, political feasibility, did not want to, uh, to admit their wrongdoing. They continued ahead. 
And now we have a $51 billion infrastructure project that has provided Australians with slightly less subpar internet speeds that will ultimately be obsolete within the next couple of years. Uh, this is uh, obviously infuriating, especially considering that the government now is placing a tax, a tax on internet users who don't use the NBN. So if you have the NBN in your household, you are not subject to this tax. But if you have an internet uh, provider that is not, uh, that doesn't give you NBN, your internet is about to get $7 more expensive, $7 and a few cents more expensive uh, to help pay for this failed infrastructure project. Uh, one more reason to support the work that we do here at the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. Uh, the government is taking huge amounts of your money and then they are spending it in the worst possible way. We need to get that under control. Finally, ExxonMobil is in a bit of a hot uh, place at the moment. Uh, it turns out that they are essentially paying no federal corporate tax. And this has been met with anger. A lot of people are saying that this uh, company, this massive billion dollar company, is evading taxes in Australia and that that's uh, illegal activity, something should be done about it. Uh, I'm not, uh, th this is something that my policy director understands better than I, but apparently it's not that ExxonMobil is not paying taxes, it is just using its, uh, its headquarters in other countries, uh, mainly the Netherlands, where the, where the tax rate is lower, to avoid the incredibly high corporate tax rate that we have here in Australia. Uh, now, this uh, I'm not going to speak too much on the actual tax aspect of this. I'll try to have Emily die to talk about this more deeply at a certain point. But what the government did, what the tax office did, was take a lot of finan private financial information from ExxonMobil and make it public in light of the controversy. To me, to us here at the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, this seems like retaliation before anything has been proven. Right now, what ExxonMobil is dealing with is an accusation. They haven't been proven wrong. They're, they're, right now, they're innocent. Our, our system is such that you are innocent until proven guilty. And yet the tax authority has taken it upon themselves to release the information, the private financial information of a private company in light of a controversy without anything having been proven yet. That's uh, obviously incredibly problematic. They should not have done it. Uh, we're not going to sit here and weep for massive corporations. I'm sure their massive legal team will be able to deal with this just fine. But all, if they can do this to ExxonMobil, they can do this to everyone. The process should not be the punishment in issues like this. If you are ever accused of some kind of financial crime in your, uh, in your business, you should make sure that the government isn't going to start to punish you and to put you through a, through a horrid process before you've been proven to do anything wrong. Uh, I'll try to have Emily die on soon uh, to explain this more articulately and uh, with more knowledge than I. But now we're going to switch to our interview on Bitcoin with Stefan Leverum. Thank you so much for listening. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. Hey, Stefan, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Amelia. Yeah, so for those of, of our viewers who may not know who you are, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm mostly known for my podcast, which is a self-titled podcast, the Stefan Levera podcast. I okay. am primarily a Bitcoin and Austrian economics podcast. So that's what I'm mostly known for. I mm. ha come from a libertarian and specifically Austro-libertarian, like Austrian economics informed view of libertarianism background. And so I've been, uh, yeah, so I, I'm known for doing some of the more technical and economic uh, discussion interviews on my podcast, and I'm also playing some role as an educator within the Bitcoin world. Right. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, your YouTube channel is uh, huge, so congratulations on that front. Uh, what I guess I want to talk to you about today is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, obviously, huge phenomenon. Uh, 
but a lot of people don't really understand it. It's been around now for over uh, well over a decade. And so I was hoping you could give us a little bit of an insight. So I'll start with a really bit basic question, which is, why is Bitcoin important? Great question to start with. So Bitcoin, you can't understand it without also understanding the historical context of how we ended up where we are today. So mm. we see problems with central banking and the way that there is a relation between the state and money. And so Bitcoin fundamentally is this attempt to basically separate. It's a new technology that is an asymmetric defensive technology in that sense that allows people to basically store wealth outside of the control of any one government or any one company or Mm -hmm. any one person. Whereas basically in history, what we have seen is attempts to centralize and control the money supply and you know do inflation or control it mm. in other ways using things like capital controls or currency controls depending on which country you lived in and so on so fundamentally sure. bitcoin should be thought of as a digital hard money and so what is a hard money it's a money that's hard to make as opposed to what we would contrast with say fiat money or government money which is easy to make and the system has been right. set up in such a way where it is easy for that new money to get printed or inflated. And then what that Mm. does is it basically, it's what we refer to as the Cantillon effect. Basically, those people who get the new money first, they're the winners in that scenario. And guess who gets the new money first? It's the politically connected. It's those people who are getting the loans. And typically, so that's, in our view, why we see banks, the financial institutions and financial sector is so much larger and more bloated than it would otherwise be in a real free market, hard money world. And it's just Mm -hmm. that that we've seen so much bloat there because that's where the new money is generated first. And then on top of that, we're seeing it flow into certain colloquially understood as a bubble industries, right? So the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble, and so on. And now (laughs) some people argue that we're living in the everything bubble, right? Like just everything is, we're at stock market all-time highs and bonds are just going crazy. And we're living in this weird environment where people are living through negative real interest rates. And so there's a lot of distortion uh, in the economy. And so part of what has enabled that and part of what's enabled all this massive debt and massive government welfare and warfare state is fiat money. It's the control over money. And so Bitcoin is fundamentally should be, it should be understood as a technology that separates from that. Yeah. So that's super interesting. And I think one of the things that differentiates Bitcoin from fiat currency in a lot of ways is that the the value of bitcoin is based almost completely on the trust that the users have in the currency correct right so the way we think of it is i would say it's maybe it's a little closer to this idea of all value is subjective and Mm. fundamentally the reason we hold money is we need a medium of exchange right an indirect medium of exchange and that's this whole concept going towards the monetary medium and so if you look back at Karl Menger and so on he wrote about this idea on the origins of money and so that is sort of carried forward now and a really good article if your listeners are interested is to check out Nick Zabo shelling out Mm. and you can find that on the nakamotoinstitute.org page that's a great website Uh, but the basic point is Bitcoin should not be thought of as like a really efficient technology. It's an, it, in some ways, it's actually very computationally inefficient. But mm. what the real trade-off is, is that it uses this massive, massive use of computational resources across all the full nodes around the world and all the people doing Bitcoin mining around the world to mm. give what we call social scalability, right? So it's right. that idea that you know, when we were all, you know, living in tribes and whatever, and there was that, you know, you might have heard of that number, Dunbar's number. Uh, So it's this number of about 150 people. That's about how many meaningful relationships you can have. And then, so the idea is, if you want to try and scale beyond that, well, you need some kind of technology. And it just so happens that the human institutions, you know, technology, if you will, has always, in history, just been abused and uh, taken to to advantage the people who have a certain level of power and control over society. And Mm. so Bitcoin is basically an attempt to use a very, if you will, a large amount of computing power to kind of take that power away from any one individual. And so in that way, you could sort of think of it like in some ways it's inefficient, but in other ways it's actually really efficient because the idea is that the 
you know, it's like by doing this, we're able to basically have a hard money that is not able to be inflated so easily or, or manipulated so easily. And that brings net massive benefits to society. And as I'm sure you and many of the, you know, many of our listeners today coming from more of a libertarian viewpoint, mm. we can think of it like this will force governments to become smaller. So right. why do I say that? I say that because governments today live under this massive subsidy, if you will, of having cheap credit. Why mm. is that cheap credit? Well, because there's all this fiat money. It's easy to inflate. It's easy to have a market for debt. And so how do governments fund a lot of what they do? It's bonds. It's debt. So they are selling yep. debt Printing and they're pushing money. the cost. Yeah, and they're pushing the cost onto future generations. And mm -hmm. so as you know, I'm sure many of your listeners coming from a more libertarian perspective will appreciate, it's very easy to get or it's more easy to get voted in if you're promising people things, right? If you look at the US election, <laughs> right. you're looking at how, you know, Bernie Sanders and these guys are promising fully taking away all student debt. And, you know, right. people like, you know, Yang Gang, who recently started, uh, dropped out of the election, but he was promising yeah. more pe more money. He was saying, look, I'll just give you guys $1,000 a month. It's easy. And even Donald easier. Trump isn't, uh, Donald Trump isn't a, a fiscal conservative by any extent of the imagination. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right on that. Of course. And then so how do you expect any kind of libertarian political candidate to get voted in when they're trying to say, I'm not going to give you free money. I'm going <laughs> to campaign on a message of personal responsibility and people, you know, having their own family and community networks rather than mm. big daddy government or big mother government doing right. all the welfare state and warfare state. And so it just from my perspective, I view it like standard political activism is not actually going to achieve much. I actually view it more like Bitcoin is going to do a lot more to make the government smaller than standard political activism. Now, I do see a value in standard political activism from an education perspective, mm. uh, but I actually believe that over time, more and more people will transition into a Bitcoin world because I think it's like economic reality is just reasserting itself, right? It's just sure. a harder money. It's just yeah. better money. So more people will adopt it, and then over time, it'll just become less and less accepted relative to government fiat or government monies like the Australian dollar, the US dollar, and so on. Now, obviously, that's a big task. That's a tall order. It's going to take a while for that to happen. But mm -hmm. I view it like a slow but steady process of more and more people just opting into this parallel Bitcoin economy. And so if you look at some of the basket cases of the world, right, Argentina, Argentina Venezuela, etc., right. like these monetary right. basket cases, what do we normally see? We see dollarization, right? They go for the sure. harder money because they can't trust their local money anymore. My mm. thesis and the thesis of many Bitcoin people is that over the world, over the long horizon, maybe 10, 15, 20 years plus, yeah. we're going to see Bitcoinization. And so well, if you want yeah, to be that makes ahead sense. of that. And actually, in, yeah. in Venezuela, for example, we already see people, and I mean, I think Venezuela has made it illegal, but people want to use Bitcoin because it's uh, it's secure and it fluctuates obviously a lot less than the um, real, I, I guess. It's the Venezuelan real or the Venezuelan peso or whatever it is there. Uh, uh, so Venezuelan I definitely... Bolivar. Yeah. Bolivar, that's what it yeah. is. But um, I, I do want to let me ask you there. something. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Uh, well, if you want to make that last point, because I'm going to move on. Yeah, sure. I'll just make a very quick point. I would say we've got to be careful with that. Even in the Venezuela case, it's not necessarily that everyone's jumping into Bitcoin. Yes, there is some use in terms of on the margin, people using it to transfer value across the borders. But right now, mm -hmm. there are. if we're talking specifically about Venezuela, I would say there are other barriers and hurdles to Bitcoin adoption there in terms of education, the technology, not everyone's got a smartphone, not everyone has the right sure. ways to secure Bitcoins and so on. But somewhere like Argentina or other places in the world, we are starting to see, and just in the Western world, as a speculation. But yeah, go on. Uh, 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 let's, uh, yeah. yeah, go on. No, I, I definitely agree with, with most of what you're saying. And conceptually, uh, Bitcoin is a big winner in my mind. Uh, but then I have conversations with people that are a little bit more skeptical. And we've seen adoption grow. I think now you can buy certain mainstream products with Bitcoin, like certain airlines are taking Bitcoin, things like that. There are certain like online companies that will take Bitcoin. But it is, as you say, a complicated system to work. So, for example, a transaction between you and I and Bitcoin can take anywhere between a few seconds 
and several minutes. And that's a, that's a really strong barrier to adoption, don't you think? Right. So the way I am thinking of that is people have to make the right comparative here. So mm. think of it like Bitcoin is more like a competitor against, say, the SWIFT network than it is a retail payment network right now today. Now, gotcha. yes, you can use it in certain ways, like just in retail, you can kind of use it anyway. There are websites that will do it and you can. But longer mm. term, we should view this like Bitcoin is become, going to become like a big settlement layer kind of network. And so one mm. on-chain Bitcoin transaction might actually represent many, many, many other transactions kind of packaged in. So uh, maybe a better analogy, something like a container ships analogy. So mm. you could think of it more like, over time, we'll see many, 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 many Bitcoin banks, and then these transactions between them will be kind of more like a settlement of thousands or millions of transactions uh, between those different customers across the network. And so let me let me try and spin this in a way that maybe I think is a better comparative. So think uh -huh. of it like my friend Safety and Amus, who, who spells it out in the Bitcoin standard, and he talks about it as this idea of Bitcoin is the only alternative to central banking today. If you want to send money internationally, what do you do? Well, you've either got to send it through your bank and use like the SWIFT network and do all that you know, rigmarole and it'll take days mm -hmm. and they'll charge you all this international transfer fees. Or, I mean, right. yeah, you can use something like PayPal and so on. But mm. fundamentally, just ultimately, where is that settlement occurring? Well, it's done by central banks, right? Like if right. you go down to the very base layer, that's what's happening there, right? So, yeah, there's all these other layers up on top of it. And those layers can be permissioned, let's not forget, right? There might be AML and sanctions and other financial surveillance laws in place or capital sure. controls in place, right? So you can get stopped out there. You can get stopped there. So that's one mm. thing. And the other way is if you were to move gold around. But again, how expensive <laughs> is it to move gold around the world? How long oh, yeah. does it take? How much trust does it require? Of course. And then the only alternative to those systems is Bitcoin. So I can mm. send in a way that is trust minimized that's the important part that you don't have to trust any particular bank you can actually set up what we call a bitcoin full node and that is basically some software that you can run on your computer you can think of that like a fake bitcoin detector so if i send you fake bitcoins your bitcoin node software will detect that and say oh hold on a second stefan didn't send me some real bitcoin so i i don't recognize that payment mm. right and so that is the way that we should yeah, so it's more like a competitor in some ways to like Swift and moving gold around the world. And so when you view it in that sense, it's dramatically cheaper and dramatically faster because yeah. if you do a, an AUD payment or a US dollar payment across borders, that can be pulled back, that can be controlled, that can be stopped. But a Bitcoin payment, it's not so easy to do that. And it's much cheaper to do that. There have been examples of people mm. have moved, you know, eighty million dollars for, you know, some fraction of a dollar, right? Like some, you know, right. under a dollar kind of fees. So it's just another whole level of asymmetric defensive technology using cryptography. So we can think of it like we are living in this world that's becoming a techno authoritarian world. <laughs> so you know, governments. Yeah, that's a good way and, to put it. Yeah, right. And governments and. Um, banks are kind of being deputized by FATF, Financial Action Task Force, and some of these other organizations to do AML and mm. sanctions compliance and this, that, and the other, and there's inflation and all of that, when Bitcoin is like a techno-libertarian answer to that. So that's sure. the way we should think of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, well, Stefan, I could talk to you for hours and hours about this. Uh, I have several more questions, but alas, our time is up. But thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, for anyone who wants to know more about what you talk about, uh, do you want to tell us what the name of your YouTube channel is? Yeah, sure. So I guess there's probably two main resources you can find me. So firstly, in a personal one, that's stefanlevera.com, and you can subscribe to the podcast and everything there. And you can find me on Twitter at Stefan Levera. And then the other resource I'll point your listeners to is ministryofnodes.com.au. So that is a, a website where I and my co-founder do Bitcoin education. So if you want to learn about Bitcoin, we've got articles there and we run webinars if people are interested to learn. Fantastic. Well, Stefan, thank you so much. And we hope to have you on again soon. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to Taxed and Wasted a podcast by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. 
If you want to learn more about the ATA, please go to taxpayers.org.au where you'll be able to find much, much more information about us. Don't forget the Freedman Conference is coming up, and you can actually get your tickets on the same site or consider becoming a donor. Some levels of donation will get you a free ticket or a free VIP ticket. If you haven't already, please take the time to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes or Podchaser. It helps more people find the show. Thank you once again for listening to the very first episode of Taxed and Wasted. We'll see you next time.